How's everyone doing? You doing good? Yeah. Yeah, they got like one person. Yeah, all right. Everyone else doing good too, hopefully? Uh, that was good worship, amen? amen. I tell you, we're uh, really praying to uh, be open to the Spirit of God. You know, I mean, the, you know, somebody, I was reading about an old man named Smith Willsworth, and he was talking about how so many churches go through the motions, but they're just really dead spiritually. And I, I don't know about you, but I want to be alive spiritually, amen? I, I want the Spirit of God. I want there to be a holy ghost excitement, a passion for God. And, and I tell you, this world, it's so easy for this world to kind of suck that out of you. But uh, I tell you, we need to, uh, times like this to just really build us up in the Spirit so that we can have that holy passion and that, that strength to get through uh, the crazy... You guys start my time. There you go. All right, there you go. Good. She last time didn't do my time, and I went for like two hours. It's not good, so... <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. If your Bibles turn with me to Daniel chapter 4, verse 1, and I'm going to let Kevin have that joke about the, the whatever, he, what was your joke about? The, I don't know what it was, but anyways, I'll let him win this week. So uh, we got a lot to go through. I'm going to try to go through a whole chapter. So uh, let's buckle our seatbelts and get ready. Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. The title of today's message is, Can God Can Save Anyone? God Can Save Anyone. I don't know if I've told you, but I was saved on a bet. Uh, a bunch of Young Life kids were at my school, and uh, Dan Hicks, who led me to Christ, he said, who's the worst kid at your school? Who's somebody who said, cannot be saved, that's too far gone, and they hands down said me. And so I'm here today on a bet, uh, basically someone impossible. But uh, we're going to see today in chapter 4, we're going to see the testimony of the last person you would ever think could get saved, and that person is King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar was a brutal king. He was the king of the whole known world at the time. He uh, would tear people limb from limb, literally. He would uh, tear your house down and turn it into a dung hill or a cesspool. He would uh, cut you into pieces. He was just a mean, mean guy. But here we're going to see the king of the Babylonian Empire he, where he gets saved, where God gets a hold of him. And how I know, I'll tell you this, A.W. Tozer said we should pray that God sometimes breaks people. How many know it's, we, we don't like that word, it's not PC, but how many know, how many came to the Lord because of brokenness? Anyone, raise your hand, there you go, at least half of you. It's when we realize we're not all that we thought we were, or what our moms told us we were, or somebody told us we were, uh, we, that's when we look up and realize our need for God, and that's what King Nebuchadnezzar is going to do today in chapter 4. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. And thank you for the sweet time of worship. I pray, Lord, that as your spirit ministered through song and through singing and through surrender, I pray right now that you would just speak to us through your word. It's your word that reveals your heart to us. It's your word that tells us how you want to be worshipped. It's your word that shines light on the dark areas of our life. It's your word that exhorts us to how to walk in right ways. And it's your word that tells us that you've loved us with an everlasting love. It's your word that tells us that you loved us so much that you gave your only son. And that you freely gave him and with him will you not also give, freely give us all things. Through your son you give us all things. So Lord, we just thank you and we just surrender our hearts. We continue in that spirit of surrender to say, Lord, speak to us. Speak to us. Just say that to him, would you? Speak to us, Lord. Speak to us. Give us that rhema word. I was studying this week and where it says that with God, nothing is impossible. And that word nothing there is, is the word rhema. And it's saying, basically it's saying this, that with the rhema word, nothing is impossible to God. When God speaks to you a promise, when he speaks to you, quickens your, his word to you, nothing is impossible when it's that rhema word, when it's that specific word for a specific people at a specific time. So God, speak to us, we pray that rhema word, and open our hearts and open our minds to what you're saying to us, the church. We love you, and we ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. And Greed said, Amen. 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 Verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. This is Nebuchadnezzar talking. Peace be multiplied to you. Verse 2, I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God had worked for me. 
I know God does signs and wonders. He still does, and that's what he did to Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 3, how great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. Verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, I like to say King Nebi or Nebi, Nebuchadnezzar was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. How many know this? There is a lot of people who are resting and they're in a false sense of peace. How many know that? I look at my new age aunt and uncle and I look at them and they just seem so happy, so peaceful. But how many know that is a false peace? And we need to pray. I need to remember to pray for them because sometimes I think, golly, how, how is their life so happy? How many know just because it looks happy, how many know it's not really happy? And how we know that sometimes we need to pray that God will kind of show them the reality of what's going to happen in eternity, kind of here to wake them up. But he says, uh, I was in my house flourishing in my palace. Verse 5, I saw a dream which made me afraid. God showed him that things weren't as good as he thought they were. That made me afraid and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. The most powerful ruler in the known world at the time was at rest in his palace. He was flourishing in his position as the king of the whole known world at the time. Yet he laid on his bed and was troubled. I want to say this to you today. The person you think that is so closed to the gospel could be a lot closer than you think. Amen? They could be struggling with questions about eternity and morality and true meaning of life. I'll tell you this. I, I was a pretty... I know it's hard to believe, but I was a pretty intimidating person in high school. And Dan Hicks, he was a two-time national champion, so he wasn't too afraid of me. But I remember his boldness to come up to me and say, do you know what that cross on your chest means? And I wore a cross just for my mom in remembrance. You know, I was a Catholic at the time, so I thought I'd just wear it as a, it was a crucifix, and I thought I wore this for my mom. And he said, do you know what happened on that cross? And I remember kind of having an attitude like, who are you? To just come up to me without knowing me and ask me about God. You don't do that. Even if you knew me, you shouldn't do that. But I remember a part of me was offended, but a part of me was very impressed with his boldness. I want to tell you, Christians, brothers and sisters, you need to pray for that boldness sometimes. Just to ask people, how are you doing with God? How are you doing? Have you ever thought of eternity? And people, you watch them, I mean, they freak out. But how many know it's a good question to ask people? Because the devil and their flesh is trying to get them to flourish in their palace and flourish in the busyness of life and seem like all is well. But how many know without Christ, all is not going to be well? So we need to lovingly ask them questions and say, hey, how you doing? How you doing? The questions that you and I had settled the day we came to know Christ. Don't you love that? That almost all your questions were settled. Just the peace of knowing. I remember I had so many questions before I received Christ, but once I gave my heart to him, a lot of the questions went away. How many know what I'm talking about? It just was, you just had peace. You knew the meaning of life. Verse 6. Therefore I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon. Here are these guys that have failed them before. We saw in chapter 2. He brings in again the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. This is the second dream he's had. Verse 7. The magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. Verse 8, but at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar. This is kind of interesting to me. It says, according to the name of my God in him. He, Belteshazzar, was his God. It was Bel, was not Baal, but Bel was his Belteshazzar. B-E-L was Nebuchadnezzar's God. And he named him after that because he knew, as he says in a second, he says, in him is the spirit of the holy God. So to him, Bel was the most powerful God. So he names Daniel, after his most, he thinks, most powerful God. But he's going to see in this chapter that Baal is not the true God, and he's not the most powerful God. But that's why he says that. And I told the dream before him, saying, verse 9, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, he was just over them, he wasn't a magician, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and no secret troubles you. Explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. When King Nebi woke up, he didn't know what to make of his dream. He knew it had spiritual significance, 
but he couldn't put the pieces together. So he did the same thing he did, as I said, in chapter 2. And even though these astrologers and magicians were were powerless the first time, he now calls them in again. Isn't it amazing how quickly we forget? Isn't it amazing that they didn't work before, but somehow we think they'll work again? But he forgot. When the magicians were again unable to interpret his dream, then Nebi called for what? God's man. He called for Daniel. How many like to be like that? I, I'd like to be that. If I, if I wasn't a pastor, I'd like to be. I, I think you guys should be that way at work. They go, hey, you know, all my other guys don't, can't give me wisdom, but this man of God or woman of God can. Bring him into my office. I want to hear from God. How many know that should be us? Amen? The, one of the spiritual gifts is the word of wisdom. We should be able to have wisdom to the problems of our businesses or our home business or our families. We should be able to get wisdom, divine wisdom from God. Just like Daniel, because what? God is no respecter of persons. He will give wisdom, as it says in James 1, 5, to whoever asks. If you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. We just need to spend the time to wait to get the wisdom. Amen? Amen. You out there? Amen? Some of them? How you doing? Amen. Two of you. All right. Okay. Woo! Love it. Amen. Yeah. There you go. Verse 10. These were the visions of my head. While on my bed, I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth. And its height was great. Verse 11, the tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Hear this. I couldn't believe this. Does anyone have any idea how tall the walls of Babylon were? Anyone? Anyone want to throw out a number? Just throw out a number. Just see how wrong you are. Throw out a number. What? You're pretty. See, he knew. I said it to exaggerate. 300. You're a little wrong. 320 feet. 320 feet. That's pretty tall. Can you imagine the labor it took? I, I'm trying to get pavers put in my backyard and thinking that's a major feat. Can you imagine building 320 feet high walls and hear this, 80 feet thick. They were so thick that six chariots could race on the top of the wall. And the wall was a short little wall. It was only 57 miles long. Can you imagine? Imagine we got a job for you to do. We want you to build a wall 320 feet high, 80 feet thick, and only 57 miles long. You know he had some serious slave labor back then. I mean, my goodness. But, and hear this, the hanging, he's going to talk about a tree and all this that can be seen forever. He had a palatial gardens, these hanging gardens on the walls that could be seen from miles away. Some people set up to 70 miles away. It was, there were walls were so tall in the gardens. They were the hanging gardens of Babylon, and they were, they were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. That's how powerful this man was. That's how impressive. And it says that he wanted to even make it grander. I mean, that's amazing. And that's where you see the Tower of Babel. He wanted, remember, to, they built the tower there. They were quite incredible builders, even though it was a wrong thing. Verse 12. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and it was, it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Nebi's dream was that of a tree so big that all the beasts of the earth could gather under it. Its, its many leaves and abundant fruit, plus it grew so high that one could see it from any point of the earth. Not maybe any point, but could see it from very, very far away. You know, when you don't travel a whole lot, when you have a car, how I many know oh, 70 miles is a long way. So they, could, they felt that you could see it anywhere in the world, in the earth. Nebi's hanging gardens, as I said, were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. He, he, just, he was an amazing builder and architect, and he, it just was amazing. Verse 13. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher. Most theologians believe the watcher here is an angel. How many know there are angels watching you? Angels are watching you. It says, I believe, in 1 Corinthians 12, or yeah, 12, I think, or maybe it's 11, 12. Yeah. It talks about that, 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 that women should be in uh, subjection to authority or to their husbands. And you go, "Eh, eh." but it says that the angels are watching, that the angels would not be offended. How many know that angels are kind of particular about things being done right? 
Does anyone know why? I think I've shared this before. Because why? They saw one third of their brethren or their fellow angels fall with Satan. And how many know when you see that, when you see one third of the holy angels fall from heaven like lightning, you get a little concerned when things start going wrong. And how many know there are angels watching us and seeing how we live and seeing how we do things? And how many know that should encourage us, right? That there's angels watching over us, but there should also kind of keep us on our toes to live right. How many know I don't want my guardian angel to be bummed that he's stuck with me? You know, how do I get saddled with this guy? You know, I would like to make my angel kind of happy that he's with me. Amen. You know what I mean? That he say, hey, I'm really good. You know, because I'm sure they've had a few people over the years, you know, and they, I'm sometimes I think they get bummed being my angel. You know what I mean? Man, why did I get this guy? But anyways, I want to change that. But he says, and there was a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven. Verse 14. He cried aloud and said thus, chop down the tree. Cut off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit, let the beasts get out from under it, and the birds from its branches. Verse 15, nevertheless, leave the stump and the root in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, in tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Verse 16, let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of a beast. This is the original Beauty and the Beast story right here. And let seven times or seven years, most theologians believe, pass over him. Verse 17, this decision is by the decree of the watchers or angels and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know, I love this, that the most high rules. How many of us need to believe that today? The Most High still rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he wills, and sets it over the lowliest of men. Verse 18, this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of the kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. How many know that's pretty good when a pagan king says, you're able because God's in you. That's pretty cool. This magnificent tree extended into heaven. Its angels, it, and the angel descended and cut the tree down, leaving only a stump. But how many know a tree can grow back from a stump? Amen. And so it, it, there's still a stump, even though it's going to be chopped down and cut back considerably, it's still a stump. Verse 19, then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, my Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, its interpretation concern your enemies. I like this. Here's Daniel with a pagan king, a king that took him captive, and yet Daniel sits there speechless for a long time. Finally, he said, King Nebi, I wish this dream did not apply to you, but applied to your enemies. How many know that's nice? You know, he could have said, Daniel, Daniel you know, look at Daniel's tenderness. He could have said, this serves you right, you wicked king. You've been such a pain to so many people for so long. You're tearing people's arms off. You deserve everything that's going to happen to you. You deserve to get cut down. But he didn't do that, did he? He said, I wish this was for your enemies, not for you. Jesus, if you remember when he, in Luke 19, 41, when he stood before Jerusalem, and he says he longed to gather Jerusalem. I always laugh when people say, we can't resist the will of God. You know, extreme Calvinists say, you can't resist God. Isn't it funny? Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I have longed to gather you like a hen would gather her chicks, but you would not, what? Come to me. How many know we can resist God? He draws, but we can still resist him. And it says that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He wept. He didn't say, fine, I'll reject you because you rejected me. He wept over them because he knew the hardship that comes when people reject him. I know that. God weeps over you and I when we reject him, not because 
He's angry with us because he knows the hurt that comes to our life when we reject him. How many know I love this? That, you know, I always say this. Oprah said, I cannot serve a God who's jealous. But how many know God is jealous for you and I because not because he's insecure. He's jealous for you and I because he knows he's the only one that can truly bless us. And I'll tell you, I'm learning the older I get, I want to be as jealous for God as he is for me. Amen. How many know your spouse can't give you the love you need? Your kids can't give you the love you need. Your friends can't give you. But how many know when you get your love first from God and you realize he's your all in all, everything is in its right place. Amen. Then you're more of a giver of a love than a need to be someone who's always an umbilical cord looking to suck love out of people. How many know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean? We, don't, we run from people like that. But how many know people like to be around people that bless them and love them and try to give love to them rather than just always take love? Got quiet there. I'm sorry. You and I might be able to quote the Bible. We might be able to tell about the last days and prophecy and, and revelation. There might be no end to our knowledge of the Bible. But hear this, I'm learning this, that people really don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I'll tell you, when the Bible says that pursue love and the greatest gift is love, how do you know that's true? Love is it. You know, I, I've been duped by the devil in the past because I've been so frustrated with the liberalness of the church and, and the lack of real purity in the church that I've gotten angry with the church. And how many know that I can be saying the right things, but if I'm angry, how many know that's kind of offensive to you guys? But if I speak the truth in love with a heart like God to say, to, I want to see you walk in the fullness of God, how many know that changes everything? Amen. It's the spirit in which it's given. You can, I love what one man said to me prophetically. He says, Craig, you love to speak the truth. But my question to you is, do you speak the truth in love? Amen. And it's only taken me 34 years to finally get that. He told me that about 20 years ago. I'm not a small man. But anyway, you know, I, uh, that's Forrest Gump if you're not sure. But um, I'm learning that. I'm learning that I need to love, and God spoke to me, as I said, and, and I can keep saying it because it was God, but he said to me, Craig, it was my love that touched you. Now let my love through you touch others. And I promise if you will love my people, I promise that I will, as, as he said, what? That it's, by, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Amen. If I show you the loving kindness of God, how many know that God will convict you of sin? Yeah. Amen. Now, my fear is if I love you too much, you'll just say, hey, I'm great, I'll keep, keep sinning. But how many know when you are overwhelmed in a good way by the love of God, you go, why would I do things that keep me from God? How can I hurt such a good father? Amen? Verse 20. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth. Verse 21. Whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, to which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. Verse 22, It is you, O king, who gave, uh, have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. Verse 23, Inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, or angel, a holy one coming down from heaven, He's, and saying, chop down the tree to, and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze. In the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts of the field, till seven times or seven years pass over him. Verse 24, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King. Verse 25, they shall drive you from the angels. These are angels now. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven. And seven times or seven years shall pass over you till you, I love this, know that the Most High rules. How many know I want to see that again in America? We need to know that the Most High still rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. 
How many know this? I read one of the commentators here that says sometimes when a nation is rebellious, he'll give us leaders to make us frustrated so that we repent and turn back to him. Amen. I'm Amen. There you go. It's time to, how many know it's time to repent? Amen. Amen. It's time to turn to God. It's time to say, we got it, God. We've been bad. It's time to turn back to you. Amen. Or is that too harsh? Was I not loving that? No, okay. All right, good. Verse 26. And as much as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom, hear this, shall be assured to you after you come to know heaven rules. Don't you love that? It's not if you come, it's when you come. Isn't that a good that God knows all things? When you come, you'll be back, right? You'll come. I'm going to keep a stump so you can come back. You are the tree, he says, Nebi, Daniel, so tall, but you have grown, you've been cut, you're going to be cut down, driven out to the fields where you will live like a beast. Isn't that amazing? Can you imagine? If you're not sure of the sovereignty of God, here's the most powerful man in the known world, and now he's the beast, like in Beauty and the Beast. Now he's running around. The walls that he built, he's now running around on them like an ox, just running all over the place like the Beauty and the Beast. Now you remember he ran up his castle. That's the way it is. I just kind of picture it. How many can see that? I can kind of see this king, you know, this all, you know, this great king now is an animal. Seven years he did this. And Daniel says, but just as the stump of the tree was left, you will someday return to power in seven years. Verse 27 Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be lengthening of your prosperity. In addition to Daniel's tenderness, notice his honesty. Notice his incredible love for King Nebuchadnezzar. His honesty to save this king that could tear him limb from limb. He says, turn away from your unrighteousness. Turn away, King Nebuchadnezzar. Like Daniel, we need to care enough to say to people, you've got to turn away from the path of sin that you're on. You've got to come to Jesus. The Bible says, how will they know unless a preacher is sent? How many know you're a preacher in the sphere of influence you have? Amen? Amen. You're the one that needs to tell people, hey, turn from the path. You know, you need to turn to Jesus. And sure, right away they're not going to say thank you. They're going to go, mm, that's your opinion, right? But how many know that sits with them when they're laying on their pillow, when they're, when they're well, not laying on, when their head's on their pillow, they think about what you said. That's what Jesus did telling the young, rich, young ruler. Remember the rich, young ruler came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to have eternal life? And it says Jesus looked at him and he said, obey the commandments. He goes, I've done all that. And then it says, he looked at him with compassion. There's the love. He looked at him with compassion, and he realized, basically, this is my paraphrase, he realized that his God was what? His money. And so he looks at him and he says, because he said, I want eternal life. And he says, go and sell all your wealth and give to the poor. Now, that scares if you're rich. <gasps> but how many know that doesn't mean you can't be wealthy? It just means your wealth cannot be your God. And Jesus said, you want some eternal life? Sell your wealth and come follow me. He could have been the 13th disciple. Isn't that amazing? And it says, sadly, it says he left sadly. He left sad. He heard that. He heard the call of God. God answered his prayer. He said, oh, what must I do? And he told him what to do. And it says he was sad because why? He had great wealth. I mean, no, a lot of times, you know, since we live in northwest Tucson, a lot of us have great wealth. And how many know that sometimes is a hindrance to us really serving God? James said, is it not the poor that God has called to be rich in faith? And I want to tell you this. Even if you have lots of money, if you want to give it to the church, you can. (laughs) I really hate him now. But anyway, no. (laughs) But hear this. You can be rich in self even without being rich in money. And you need to be poor. Remember what Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. You need to be poor. We need to be realized we're not all that. That's what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. He's realizing, here's the king. He can build 320-foot walls, 80 feet thick, and he's realizing, I'm not all that. I'm a beast. How I many know it says in Psalm 73 that Asaph says, he says he's raging against God. How can the wicked prosper? How this? And he says, I must have been like a brute beast before you. How many know we can be brute beasts? 
When we get angry, when we get mad at God, ah, we act like a beast. But I love what Asaph said. It was when I came in the sanctuary of the Lord, when I came in his presence, then I realized, came to my sense, I realized how the wicked are here today and gone tomorrow. How many know we need to be in the house of God more? So we come to our senses. We hear the word of God. The ultimate expression of self-love is not telling people the truth, but rather it's holding the truth from people who are lost. Hear this. Would you rather have people love you here by not telling them the truth and then hate you for all eternity? Or would you rather have people maybe get angry with you here and get saved and love you for all eternity? Amen? Amen? We are so worried about the now that we forget that people will hate us for eternity if we haven't told them. I don't remember telling you the dream I had with my friend Glenn, but I said my friend Glenn spit in my face, cussed me out when I first came to Christ, and I said, literally, I went to my car, and I said, to hell with him then. The Lord gave me a dream and showed him. It was like the white throne judgment, and I'm in heaven with God, and everything's good, and all of a sudden I look, and I see my friend Glenn, and I go over there, and I go, Glenn! I'm thinking he's in heaven. I go, Glenn! And he's weeping, and his tears streaming on his face. And I say, Glenn, what's going on? He goes, why didn't you tell me that Jesus was the only way? Why didn't you love me enough to tell me, even though I spit on you, even though I cussed you out, why didn't you love me enough to tell me? If you knew Jesus was the only way, why didn't you love me? And I remember just weeping and weeping and weeping. I woke up crying. And I was so thankful for that dream because my friend shortly after that committed suicide. But how many know, maybe our friends aren't committing suicide, but how many know, you have friends that are dying without Christ, and they're going to, if you didn't tell them, they're going to say, why didn't you tell me? Amen. They might not say it to your face, I don't know, but you're going to know that, and you're going to have that guilt of why didn't I love them enough to speak the truth and love to them? Amen? Amen? We need to have that heart. I know that seems a little hard, but how many know, I would rather have people get angry with me now I can look Glenn in the eye right now with sadness of him. I believe he's a part, he's not with God. But I can say I did everything humanly possible to speak the truth and love to you. I mean, that's a good feeling when someone kills himself. Because I could have felt real guilty if I would have gone with what I felt of just pushing away from him. But God, by his grace, told me you need to keep loving him and speaking the truth to him. Look at the contrast of the tenderness and the honesty of Daniel here. But notice the stubbornness and the foolishness of King Nebuchadnezzar. The stubbornness. It isn't amazing that you can, that here's Daniel speaking these incredible words. It's the second time he's seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego do an amazing miracle last week. And now he's still stubborn and still goes, yeah, well, that's your opinion, kind of. Verse 28. All this came upon King Nebi. Verse 20, that's the Craig version. Verse 29. And at the end of 12 months, about a year later, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. Verse 30, the king spoke saying, Is this not great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling? Do you hear the I there? And my mighty power for the honor of my majesty. It kind of sounds like Satan when he, ruled, when he went and, you know, I think Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, when he says, I, I will make myself above the most high God. I, I. How many know Satanism is not a bunch of witches and warlocks doing, you know, pentagrams and doing little, you know, horn symbols. How many know the kingdom of Satan is what? The kingdom of self. I will do this. I am God of my life. I tell you, you know, what was that movie with, uh, was it, I forget who it was, where he says, I am the captain of my destiny, the guy from Africa, I forget, was it Tutu or what, I don't know. But you remember, whenever you say, I am the captain of my life, I am the guardian of my destiny, I mean, that's a scary place. Because that's what made the, all this sin problem happen is when Satan said, I will make myself above the most high God. And how many know man's flesh has been saying that ever since? And we need to resist that. We need to what? Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and what? He must flee. Might, not might flee. He must. If you submit to God, right? As I said you've got to serve somebody. You submit to God. How many know the devil has to flee? Yes. Because Jesus is your Lord. Not only did Nebuchadnezzar hear the Lord through the dreams that Daniel interpreted, but he literally saw the Lord, as we saw last week, in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in the fiery furnace. 
like a persistence. I, I don't know about you, but I'm amazed at the persistence of God. He's like, as, as, as uh, I think it was Billy Graham said, the hound of heaven. He, 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 he goes after King Nebuchadnezzar, and, and even though he hardened his heart and refused to acknowledge him, he kept pursuing him. And I love that about God. I tell you, I, I, I know God as a personal God because I did every. It took God about a year from the day I kind of said okay to God, said I would be interested, to when I really made him. I mean, no, a lot of people make Jesus Savior. I made Jesus Savior, in this, you know, about December 1980. But it wasn't until December 5th, 1981, that I made him Lord. And I said, Lord, I've ruined my life. Now if you want my life, it's yours. How many know we need that more in our lives? Amen. To say, God, I'm done. I, I've, I've just messed this up big time. It's yours. I give you, Jesus, take the wheel. Right, here, take it. Take the reins, take the wheel, take whatever you want. Just take it because I have messed it up. Hear this, guys. Pride is the foundational sin of everyone who's not saved. Pride is what keeps people from coming to know God. The Bible says it's the pride of a man who will bring, that brings him low. But a man of lowly or humble spirit will find honor. I'll never forget, my, I did my Uncle Mike's and my Italian family, mafia guys, and, and I'll never forget doing the funeral. And did the funeral and people got saved and it was great. But at the end of the funeral, all of a sudden they started playing the song by Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. How many know that is not a good Christian anthem? That's the devil. That should be, instead of sympathy for the devil, the stones, that should be it. I took the blows and did it my, you know, and I went to hell for it. Yeah! You know, I mean, no. That's not a good song. Amen? Amen. But every Italian that I, in my family seems to just play that song. Boy, I tell you. Yeah. But anyways, pride is what caused Lucifer to fall. He was the head worship leader in heaven. And he just finally one day just decided, you know what? I don't like leading worship for God. I want to have worship. I want to be God. And I want to tell you that if that's ever in you or me, we need to repent quickly of that. Because that can bring us low very, very quickly as we're seeing today with King Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 31. While the word was still in the king's mouth, he says, my kingdom basically, the voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, you, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. How many know there's going to be another word departed? What is Jesus going to say in Matthew 7 21? Depart from me. I never what? Knew you. Can you imagine looking at Jesus' loving eyes saying that to somebody? And I want to tell you how many know. I just heard a commentary say that. That is cocking too. He says, in the last days, many will say to me. That's over half, they say in the Greek. That means, hear this, half of the people who profess that Jesus is their Lord and Savior will not hear, welcome, enter into your rest. They're going to hear, depart from me. I never knew you. Does, does that at all shake any of you? Oh, yeah, it scares me. Woo! Yeah. And what are the two clauses, just so you don't get too scared? What is it? Know God. Gnoskos. Know him. Intimacy intimately, like a man knows his wife. Know God. Don't just know about him. Know him. Love him. Worship him. But it also says those who what? Do the will of my Father. Every day, you and I need to set our heart. Lord, I want to do your will. We say your kingdom come. Your will be done. I even like to say this, not just on earth, but your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. I mean, that's good to say. Be done thy will. But, he's gonna, but he says, depart. the kingdom has departed from you. Verse 32. And they shall drive you from men. And that your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen. And seven times or seven years shall pass over you until you know the Most High rules. Isn't this amazing? This is very loving of God to allow this to happen, isn't it? The Bible says, what does it mean to gain the whole world or Babylon and lose your soul in the strife? God loved Nebuchadnezzar so much that he was willing to turn him into a beast that he might what? Know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Verse 33, that very hour the words fulfilled, the words word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like an oxen. 
His body went, was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers. I don't understand that. That's some funky hair, isn't it? Like eagle's feathers? I mean, I think like a big bear or something, but eagle, he had like feathered hair, I guess. It was really cool. But anyways, his nails were like bird claws. Now that makes sense. Big, you know, I don't know if you saw the pictures of the sketches of like, uh, what was his name? Howard Hughes, when he was at the end, how he didn't grow out his nails. You know, I could kind of picture that. Um, he's like that. Just as Daniel had prophesied, Nebi went insane. And there's a word for it. I didn't want to go into it. But even in this, we see God's faithfulness, his loving persistence. Whatever it takes, I'm going after you, King Nebi, even if it means allowing you to go nuts, even if it allows you to act like a beast and eat grass like a dumb ox and develop feathers like an eagle and grow claws like a bird. I love you so much that I'm going to bring you to a place where you're going to see that you need me. How many know God loves you that much to bring you to that place? Amen. And if you're still kind of sort of God and sort of you, how many know God is faithful to bring you to a place where you will look up and you will say, you will know that God rules. And you will say, you know what? You rule so much, I want you to rule my life. Amen? Amen? Hear this, the kingdom of God is wherever he is Lord. How many know, you, you, you want the kingdom of God in our church services? You want the kingdom of God in your home? Then he needs to be Lord of your life. Amen? Amen? Yeah. He needs to be Lord of your life. God's faithfulness and persistence to go after people never fails to amaze me. God will do whatever it takes to bring people to a place where they will realize their need for him. I'll tell you, I, I remember that place like it was yesterday. I remember the same chair. I almost killed myself. I remember saying, God, like I said, if you can do something this life, it's yours. And my life changed immediately because I truly, I didn't make a deal with God. If you do this, I'll do this. And it was like kind of bartering. I said, God, it's yours. And people couldn't believe the transformation. Hear that. God has no respect to a person. He doesn't love Craig Roeders more than he loves you. But we have to be re- willing to surrender all. And I will tell you, sadly, as my life has kind of gotten cleaned up, I've sort of taken some things back. How I many know, as, at, at 53, I need to yield my life more to God again and get to be like, remember, be like that kid who was when he was 18 years old and say, God, I turn back to you and I give you it all again. Verse 34. And it, at the end of time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, listen to this, I love this, lifted my eyes to heaven. How I many know a beast will turn you, <laughs> he'll do that to you, to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I bless the Most High and praise and honor him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 35, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can resist his hand or say to him, what have you done? Verse 36, at the same time, my reason Return to me and the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor return to me. Hear this, guys. I'll never forget hearing someone say in this church, it seems like whenever I try to live for God, something comes in and ruins it. And this person that said that to me was one of the most prideful, stubborn people I knew. If you feel that, that always there's resistance in your life, always struggle in your life as a Christian, then guess what? What does the Bible say? God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. That means he puts his hand against the proud. If you feel that, maybe you need to ask God, is there something prideful in me that you're having to resist? But notice when King Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged God, notice he got everything back. If you're saying, man, I feel like a lot of things have been taken from me, then submit to God and guess what? God will restore. That's what the word redeem means. It means to buy back what was wasted, to buy back the wasted years. How many could use some buyback of wasted things in your life. My counselors, middle of verse 36, my counselors and nobles resorted to me and I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty and was added to me. Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol I love that word, extol. You know what that word means in the, in the Aramaic? This is, remember, written in Aramaic. You know what it means in Aramaic? I love this. This needs to be us. It means to enthusiastic praise. How many know we need to, Morgan, you need to say, we need to extol the Lord more? Is Morgan here? Where is Morgan? Right there. How many know we need to say that? Because sometimes we, we say, worship's a personal thing. 
I'm very excited. You just can't see it. It's just, I'm just bubbling inside. It's, uh, I'm so excited. How do you know? If you're happy, you know it. Your face should surely show it. How do you know in heaven, you know, I said, in heaven, you're going to be excited. I used to have people say, this worship is just way too loud. How do you know? It says his voice is like a, uh, it's like a mighty rushing waters, many rushing waters. Have you ever stood under a waterfall? Do you remember that waterfall in Oregon where you go underneath it? You know what I mean? It's like, you're like, hey, how you doing? I mean, you're screaming because it's loud. How many know God loves exuberant praise? He does. I mean, how many know? I love it. We went to Jamie's church last week. And, go, ooh, ooh, and all you guys all of a sudden became cool. Hey, what's up? How you doing? Yeah, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Here I go. Amen. You're like, amen. Right? <laughs> Got so worked up. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? We need, I love that word. Enthusiastic pray. Do you know the word enthusiasm means filled with God? In Theo, filled with God. If you're filled with God, you should be excited. You shouldn't walk around. I'm just so excited about God. God is so good. You shouldn't be baptized in pickle juice. And they say, "Oh, that's my personality." Well, change it. Okay. Do you like to be around people that are a little excited? Or do you like people? Hey, dude, God is so. Good. No, you like you know have a little life to you. Amen? Amen. Now some of you go, that's, he's messing with my personality. That's just the way I am. That's just me. <laughs> now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works and truth and his ways just. And those who, I love this, those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Do you hear what he's saying? He can put down the most powerful king in the known world. He put me down. He said, slam dunk. I don't know about you, but I want to be put down by the Lord in a good way. Do you know what I mean? Where I realize he's God, I'm not. That's a choice. The first sign of Nebi's conversion was instead of just looking down like a beast, like a dumb beast, he finally looked up to heaven. How many know, what is the saying? Sometimes we need to go to the, get to the bottom before we can look up. That's sad, right? Because you think we'd like to be wise. I love what one man of God said. He says, fools learn from their own mistakes Wise men learn from other people's mistakes. Why do you think the Bible shows so many mistakes? Not so you go, look at David, what a bonehead. No, so you can go, ho, oh, when kings should have been at war, he was on the palace roof being a little peeping Tom. No, I'm not going to do that. Right? So you can get wisdom. But it was this brokenness that he finally looked up to heaven. Verse 36, just as the prodigal son in the New Testament, came to his senses. Remember, he said, in my father's house, there's food everywhere. What am I doing out here? I'm, I'm looking, I'm feeding the pig slop, and it's looking good to me. This is ridiculous. So Nebi's reasoning and understanding returned to him. In other words, they both, the prodigal son and King Nebi, returned to the men they were before they were railroaded by their pride. Your pride will bring you low. Pride will bring you low. But when we humble ourselves, God will what? In due time, lift us up. Exactly as Daniel prophesied, Nebi returned to power. Only this time he knew that his power did not come from his own ability, but it came from God and God's mighty mercy. Amen. Proverbs 29, 23 says, Again, I said this earlier, but I'll say it again. The pride of a man or woman will bring him low. But a man of a lowly or humble spirit will find honor. How many like to have some honor in your life? Then we need to humble ourselves before God. Humble ourselves. We're going to take communion right now, and let's just prepare our hearts to be humble before him. That if there's sin in your life, if there's something you didn't like surrender, like Kevin's word, God's word through Kevin, if there's something in your life you haven't surrendered, then surrender it. Because that's all God wants you to do is just admit, just agree. That's what repentance means, to agree with God. Just say, God, you're God, you're right, and I'm wrong, and please forgive me. That's all he needs to hear. And he'll be forgiven. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? I believe that the answer for us today is we need to make the choice today to humble ourselves before God, that he in due time will lift us up. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you an invitation. We serve open communion here. 
Can you turn the lights down? We serve open communion here, but it's important if you receive communion that you know Jesus. Amen? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, then I want to give you an opportunity to receive Christ in your heart. And just like King Nebuchadnezzar, all you have to do is say, God, I surrender. You're God, I'm not. And maybe there's a second group where you've known the Lord, you've, you've walked with the Lord for a long time, but you've sort of lately, you've just kind of fallen away from Him. Your heart's gotten hardened. You're, maybe you got caught up in pride and self-rule. And today you're feeling the Holy Spirit draw you to Himself. The Bible says, today is the day of salvation. If you're here today and the Holy Spirit's drawing you to come back to Him or drawing you to receive Him for the first time, don't resist Him. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's not cussing out the Holy Spirit. It's when God draws you and draws you and you say, no, no, no. And finally, one day, God might say, okay, I, I'll honor your decision. So if He's drawing you right now, do not resist Him. Amen? Amen. Surrender to him. And, and those who are strong in the Lord, pray that God would just keep drawing people right now. I'd like us right now to pray. And, and if you need to receive Christ or recommit, just pray this prayer with me. I want everyone, if you would, pray. Even if you're doing great with the Lord, just pray this prayer out loud. Because you can never pray it too much. Amen. The Bible says in, in Romans 10, 8 and 9, it says, If we confess with our mouth... And believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, we shall be saved. So how many know we can never confess that too much? So if you're here today and you feel the need to receive Christ or recommit your life, just pray this prayer. And would everyone, even if you're doing good, pray this prayer out loud so no one feels like they're the only ones praying it. Just repeat after me if you would. Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I give up my self-rule and I yield to you. Be the Lord of my life. I give you my life for the first time or I recommit my life to you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for receiving me back. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And empower me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer to receive Christ, you prayed that prayer to recommit, know that you are now secure in his hands. And like King Nebuchadnezzar, your life can be restored and you can walk in the fullness of God. Amen.